Go ahead and turn your Bibles into the book of Romans chapter 12. I, I, I know that it, this is going to be brief today because my heart has just been torn in this passage. And, and as I'm just, just uh, struggling with it and praying over it and reading through it and searching and researching, there's just so much here. And, um, and there, there's just so much depth and, and so much wisdom that God has conveyed through the Apostle Paul that um, I'm afraid that I'll get bogged down and just mired down in details. And, and I don't want to do that because there's a simplistic message here that is absolutely powerful. And I don't want to fail to convey that. So I want to look at verses 1 and 2. And I want to talk to you guys today, this morning in Romans 12, 1 and 2, about the power of the gospel in life. And I'm not talking about life in general. I'm talking about your life personally. My life personally, the power of the gospel that is activated in the life of everyone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ, the gospel that Paul proclaimed as the power of God has begun and has started and will bring to completion the work that God intends to accomplish in every one of us. And so if you will, take a look at the text this morning, verses 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, and I'm in the New American Standard Version, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. In verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so I want to talk about the gospel, at the active power of God in the life of the believer. This is something I think that, to me, is revolutionary. It is powerful. Let me give you kind of like a, a broad picture before, and we'll kind of just kind of try to filter it down a little bit. Paul talks about, in verse 1, the mercies of God. In my mind, when I think about the mercies of God, I'm thinking about what God did and what it took and, and the generations that it went through for God to be able to give the promise that, or keep the promise that he made to Eve back in Genesis chapter 3. You are, a seed is coming. A seed is coming. And that seed that God brings into the world is going to bruise the head of the serpent. To me, that's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the message of God and him making a promise and fulfilling it and keeping it and everything that comes along with that. Paul says in this context, the mercies of God. I think the mercies of God are expressed explicitly in the gospel. That's just part of it. He talks about, he says, he calls the people in his audience here, Brethren. Calls them brothers. So then we can look at this and we can say that at least in this minute capacity, the believers who are in the city of Rome, the recipients of the letter, he now calls them brothers and sisters. No longer enemies, no longer Jews, no longer Gentiles, no longer Italians or Europeans. He calls them brothers, talks to them directly. He includes them in what God's doing in the gospel by calling them brothers as a part of the family of faith. Because God is building a family, and by faith in his provision, you become a part of that family. Then he talks about them making an offering or a sacrifice. He asks the members of the community of faith, he asks the brothers and the sisters, to offer up themselves. He didn't ask them for money. Be with me today, Jesus. He didn't ask them to join the church and be members. He didn't ask them about the building. You guys do know that they did not have a building fund, right? No building fund in the church in Rome. They're meeting in different locations, maybe small church houses, homes. 
and try that in America in 2021. We're going to have church and I'm going to meet in Donald's house today. <laughs> we'll be at Bob's next week. They're in homes, little church houses, little homes, little home churches. He asked them to offer up themselves, and then he asked for a certain type of offering from them. When he says of themselves, he says, give your complete self. Present your bodies a living and a holy sacrifice. I'll take you, God says, but I want all of you. Not some of you, not part of you, not the part that you're just willing to give up, or the time that you're willing to devote, but God is after all of you, your entire being. He says, offer up a complete and a living, holy sacrifice. Do that. Do that. And then he, he puts a definition on that. He says, this is your spiritual service of worship. So worship is not a location. It's not 9225.18. It's not a time. It's not, it's not a denomination. It's not an identity personally. Worship now then becomes the giving and the offering, the voluntary offering of all of oneself based on the example of God in Christ. And I'll explain that in a moment. But he calls that reasonable Worship. In America, we think that we worship just by showing up. Furthest thing from the truth. Furthest thing. Now, look at a phrase. I'm kind of just trying to boil this down before I can get to it. It's kind of strange, and I haven't got to my introduction yet. Just let me boil it down a little bit. He says in verse 1, I urge you, therefore. Here to me, this is a linguistic signal. He's telling his audience there's about to be a shift. I urge you, therefore. And he's starting in his letter an entire new subject. He's building the basis of the subject that he's about to talk about in this new area based on everything he shared in chapters 1 in our minds from chapters 1 through 11. He's trying to help them remember. There was a time. When every human being was considered an enemy of God. There was a time, even even a time, when every human being was under the justified wrath of God. And no one deserved what he called the mercies of God. Because we were all sinners. But then comes that moment when God, out of his own mercies sends the solution to our sin problem into the world and marches him right up to Calvary. And now everyone can place their faith in the promise of God and receive salvation. And when you get that promise and you receive that provision of God in Christ, you now are placed into a position where you are united with the victory of Jesus. Jesus went to Calvary and died, but that's, that's not the end of the story. He rose from the dead. And in that resurrection, you and I are now united with Christ in the power that raised him up from the dead. So this is what I think makes this small little few verses here powerful in the life of a believer. Because Paul is telling you, remember what's happened in the past. Everyone in the, in the, in the antediluvian age, everyone back there in the past, you know, had gone astray. Adam and then after Adam, everybody else. In in the Jewish history, he says in chapter 2 of Romans, even you Jewish people, you missed it. You missed it. You Gentiles, chapter 3 of Romans, everybody kind of sums it all up in Romans 11, 32. God considered everybody under sin that he might be able to provide a blessing for everybody and show mercy to all. So then I look at chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm trying to filter it down. Paul is telling these people now that you know where you've come from and what God has done. 
And when I'm talking about the mercies of God, I'm talking about the plan of God that culminates in what we call the gospel message. That it's not just how you get saved, but how you live. And so under this umbrella of the power of God, I think Paul is telling this group of people in his transition now, chapter 12, this is how you should live. He's going to give them instructions. He's going to give them clear instructions. He's going to tell them how to live inside of a community with one another. This is how you ought to get along. This is how you ought to treat one another. This is how you worship. This is how you serve. So he talks about this idea of being in community with each other. In this passage, he's going to talk about how you live in this world and the impact of a secular culture. Because the church is in Rome. And it's at the pinnacle and the height of Roman power. And so here's how the people of God live within a dominant secular culture. This is how you ought to live. And he's going to tell them that the gospel can not only get you to heaven, but it can transform your life here on earth. And I'm looking for that. I'm looking for that. Because if, boy, if I had time, I think Paul would stand there and tell you. You guys know Paul was long-winded, right? Paul, Paul had a tendency to carry on. He, he could preach. That brother could preach. He was long-winded. He would then tell you, listen, I got to tell you not only about the gospel, but here's how the Holy Spirit, who is living inside of you, works within the power of God to be able to do in you what you can't do for yourself. And to tell us all to stop trying to please God in our own imaginations and just simply follow the provisions God's made available, you'll have success. You'll have success. So look at the the text. He says in verse 1, here's what I'm after. This is what I'm looking for. I want you to present your bodies a living and a holy sacrifice acceptable to God. He calls it your spiritual service of worship. Some other translations call it reasonable worship. Reasonable. Reasonable. Foundational. Basic. Simplistic. Here's the least that ought to happen. He calls this worship. Look at it with me. In fact, if, you, if you'll let me, let me illustrate it. I want to try to communicate it like this. I want you to picture yourself. Standing there, standing there on the Villa del, del Rosa, on the road that leads up to Golgotha Hill, where they took Jesus, laid him down, nailed him to a cross, raised him up, hung him there, and laid him and left him there to die. Just, just picture yourself standing there. He's been beaten. He's been drugged through the courts. He's been denied. He's been brutally battered. He's lost a tremendous amount of blood. His flesh has been lacerated. He's drug in the dirt. They've driven rusty, rusty nails into his, into his wrist and through his feet. They hang him up in the heat of the day. you to see yourself when he goes to Calvary there's nothing partial about his sacrifice when he goes to Calvary he goes completely he goes thoroughly he goes literally and he dies imagine yourself watching this And you can see the specific, literal, complete sacrifice of Christ. Three days later, 
one of the ladies comes running back telling a story. He's not dead anymore. He's risen from the dead just like he said. He's not, he's not in the grave anymore. The stone has been rolled back. The seal has been broken. His body is gone. He's no longer in the grave. See, I, I, I believe the scriptures bear out that the resurrection is the proof of the acceptability of Christ's sacrifice on Calvary that his offering was acceptable to the Father and it satisfies the, the, it satisfies God so that when he's raised from the dead, it's glorious because it provides for you and I. See yourself in this. The power that, that it took and that was provided to not only keep him through the crucifixion, the suffering and the torture, the torment, the rejection and the denial, the humiliation. But the power that it took to raise him up from the dead people, Paul is telling us something. That power is available in the gospel, in the person of Christ, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit for everyone who believes. It's more than just the ability to say, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven, that I have eternal life. You see, that same power is available to strengthen you and not only save you now, but transform you. I think that's where Paul is going here. You see, I think the purpose of the gospel, not just to get you to heaven, but to transform our entire beings, mind, soul, body, transform everything about us. And here, listen to what Paul says. Just, and this is why it's important to just take, take your time. I may not be the best at taking my time because I get excited. Listen to what he says. I urge you, brethren, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, don't pass this by. Present. Present. Present your bodies. Present yourself. Present your entire being. Present everything about you. Present all of you to God. Let's don't make a mistake here. That's what God is after. He wants all of us. He wants every part of us. He wants the mind. He wants the body. He wants the soul. He wants the entirety of our being. Present yourself. When it comes to worship, don't just send money. Don't just donate time. Don't pretend like you did by God and everybody else a favor by showing up. Be with me tonight, Lord. I, I need help. He's after all of us, every aspect of our being. You see, the, the, the message of the cross is that God provided a vehicle for his own enemies to be changed. He provided a vehicle where the very people who stood up against him could now be called the sons and the daughters, brethren of God. You know what I like about this truth? You see, the sacrifice of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, was acceptable to God. And we know that's true because he raised him from the dead. He was resurrected from the dead. That tells me everything I need to know. The sacrifice of Christ was complete. It provided everything that was necessary to redeem humanity. And it pleased the Father and he raised him from the dead. You see, that you can't add anything to that. You cannot add anything to it. I would rather, like Dr. Anderson said, I would rather, I would rather live a thank you life than a have to. 
I would rather thank God for the provision of Christ and the ability by faith to trust God in his work and to say thank you for it than try to figure out how to keep myself saved. That's a lot of pressure, Ebony. That's a lot of work. If I got to save myself, I'm in trouble. If I got to figure out how to change myself and I got to make resolutions not only at New Year's but all year long, that's a problem. That's a problem. That's a lot of weight to carry. Too many Christians are carrying that inappropriate weight. The provision of Christ is acceptable. Do you know what that means? You are acceptable to God when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the provision that he made for you. You can't add to that. You can't add to it. And look what he tells them now. He's going he's gonna to transition. He tells them in verse 2, here's some instructions. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. He says, this is what the transforming power of the gospel will do. It will prevent you from being conformed. We came into the world conformed. We were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We came into the world with a bent towards the flesh and the things of this world, and we needed to be torn away from that. I couldn't help myself, coach. Couldn't fix myself. But the power of the gospel will help you to get to a place where you're not conformed. The word conformed simply is a, is a Greek word that means to be behaviorally or socially similar to something or someone else. Behaviorally or socially uh, similar to something or someone else. Someone who's conformed has been shaped and molded into a certain pattern. You came like that. You were wrapped that way. You don't have to teach children how to be selfish. Mine. Mine. <laughs> don't touch that. Okay. <laughs> It, that we come wrapped with a spirit of rebellion. We come into this world blinded by sin and a sin nature whose, whose motivation is to do whatever the, everybody else in the world is doing. He says, don't be shaped or molded into a socially uh, behavioral category that the rest of the world, and you, all you have to do is watch people these days. Just watch them. Just watch them. Because they'll have their pants down around their thighs. I need help. I need help. They talk differently. You can't understand them. What did you say? I, I'm, I'm talking current language, Pastor. You don't know about it. You're old. Yes, I am. But I think English is still English. You don't want... To hold on to the constructed patterns of behavior that exist within the dominant culture of any generation or any era. Because it's headed, it's headed somewhere and none of that stuff will prosper. Not to prosper spiritually. So look what he tells them to do. He says, don't be conformed. But then he tells them, here's what I want you to be. I want you to be transformed. The idea of being transformed is to be changed. To be changed. One's inner nature, nature or essence. That's the work that God wants to do through the gospel for everyone that believes. He wants to change the essence, the inner nature of every one of us from the inside out. When that happens, folk will get a haircut and a belt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, we were kids, we were kids, I, you know, things are just different, things. When we, wore, when we wore blue jeans as kids and we had holes in them, it's because we were on our knees and we, we might have been shooting marbles or something else, I don't know. But we were playing football, we were playing basketball, and we would tear up a pair of jeans. And, but now you go pay 50, 100 bucks and they got tears and holes all in them. 
I want to be transformed in my inner nature and essence so that my outer expression reflects the transformation that God himself through the power of his own word has accomplished in my life and that sends a signal to the whole world. See, I think that's the missing link in the 21st century church. People have become institutionalized and they want to do church. And if all you're doing is doing church, You've missed the power of God in the gospel to transform your life. And he's taking every believer somewhere. You read it at least three times this morning already. In Romans chapter 8, Paul told us that God wanted to conform us into the image of his own son. That is the goal of Christianity and the gospel. It is not membership. It is not increased budget. It is not facilities. It is the transformation of people of faith into the image of the Son of God. You'll know it when you see it. It is clear when you come across them. When somebody has been in God's presence, when somebody has been at the cross, and even if they can't say, well, I didn't die like that, I was there in my mind. I saw it in my spirit. I know what God's done for me. And I'm not the same. I'm not the same. I'm not the same. You know what I think Paul is saying by transform? At least be willing to cooperate. Don't fight the spirit of God and what he's trying to do in your life. See, because I can't change my attitude. I can't change my ways. I can't change my patterns. But God can. God can. Cooperate. If you can honestly sit here and say, Pastor, you know what? I I believe, but help me with my unbelief. I struggle in my faith. That's the ground you want to be on. If you can just be here this morning, you can say, listen, Pastor, you know what? There's still some stuff in my life. I still have some anger. I still have some stuff. I'm struggling with some things. That's the ground. Trust God for those areas and stop making excuses for it. Lay that down. Bring the offering. Bring the sacrifice. Lay it down. See, because God started that work in you already. And it is his desire to bring it to completion. Now, let's go back, because we touched on this a little bit. Go back into verse 1. He says, brothers, 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 brothers. Brothers. You know, one of the things that I think Paul has really struggled and fought to communicate in his letter to the Roman church, unity is something that will happen when transformation takes place. Unity. See, I think people who have the spirit that Jesus demonstrated, and that's how you use the gospel. I want you to see it in a moment. When the gospel is alive in your life, and you can see yourself there at the foot of the cross, when you can see Jesus hanging on that cross, and they, and they tell him, listen, if you're the son of God, come down. And you recognize that the truth is, that is the son of God, and he could very well come down. And bring heaven with him. But he stayed there. He stayed right there because of love. He stayed right there because of humility. He stayed there out of obedience to his father. Because there his will had to be done. And I think that's the big picture of where the gospel comes into our life. See, the transformation is calling For the less of me, the more of him. And if you keep looking at Christ and you recognize his example, you keep looking to him and knowing that's where your help comes from. If you picture yourself there and you recognize the victory at the cross, then humility and love are at the forefront of what God wants to do in every believer's life, in every church, everywhere across this world. See, but I think that is the message of the gospel. For God so loved the world. What did he do? He gave. What did he give? His only son. What was the result? If you believe in him, 
eternal life. That's the gospel. The motivation is love sent Jesus to the cross. Humility kept him there. What is God wanting to do in your life? The power of the gospel will take every one of us down off our high horse. See, it's not about education. It's not just about life experience and how long you've been on this earth. Fools come in all kind of ages and categories. Somebody look up at me. I hear you, Pastor. You don't have to be young to be foolish. It was love that kept him there. What are you looking for in the church? You want to walk through those doors and you want to come into a community of believers whose heart God has. You want to come into a community of believers where you can be accepted like everyone else has been accepted by God. You want to come into an environment that is loving, that is kind, that is caring. Because that's what you experienced with Christ. That is what everyone who walks through those doors ought to sense when they come. I experienced the love of God in that place. Didn't get the sense that the pastor thought too much of himself. Didn't get the sense that everybody in there was stuck up. Got the sense there was love and humility in that place. And that the power of God exists there. Let me get to my last point. I said it was going to be quick, but my help showed up. Look, look with me. Look with me when he talks about this. He talks about in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. There's the context of a secular, social, behavioral, societal norm that prevails, that everyone has to deal with in some capacity or another. And Paul says, don't allow the norms of society or the dominant culture, don't let that be the standard. The gospel, the word of God, is the standard for our lives. Anytime, anytime, people, that we allow our lives to be marginalized by the secular society, that is a form of conformity. And that is destined to fail. That is a prescription for spiritual failure every time. Don't go. Don't go. You know what I think the gospel is saying? If you will follow the example of Christ in your life, if you will cooperate with the Spirit of God in your life, do you know that's what fellowship means? It means joint partnership. It's like grabbing hands with someone and being a participant in that thing or that event. It is joining hands with the Holy Spirit. I, Spirit, I cooperate with you. I surrender. I submit. I'm a part of the kingdom building business that God has us all in, and I'm willingly in it. I'm all in it. You're going to be assured of victory. But if we, if we allow the culture to lead us, failure is imminent. Failure is imminent. So I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies. Present yourself, your whole being, as a living and a holy sacrifice. See your everyday walk, your everyday life as an opportunity to worship, not just on Sunday. Worship every day. Every day. That, it is that sacrifice that Jesus made that was acceptable to God, that makes you acceptable because of your faith in him. And he calls that your reasonable act of worship. So worship is never a place, it's never a time, it's never a denomination, it's never a style. It's always an offering. 
You come here to worship? Come sing with us. You come here to worship? Come pray with us. You come here to worship? Come serve with us. Get out there on that lawnmower with Rodney. <laughs> Trying my best, brother. Trying my best. Join up, join up with Joe Set and keep the flowers watered if you can't plant. Be an encourager, be an inviter. Be the one at the door shaking somebody's hand, helping them to experience the love of God. That, that, that brings victory. That brings victory. We call it the reasonable act of worship. Don't be conformed. Don't submit to the societal, behavioral patterns of the 21st century culture. You'll end up shipwrecked in your faith. You'll end up shipwrecked in your spirit. Don't conform. Be transformed. Let the word of God change your mind and your heart and your life. Let God's word get in your head, let it get in your heart, and then let it ooze out of your hands. Let God rule in your lives. That's what worship looks like. That's what Christianity looks like. And the gospel is where the power of God exists. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I thank you today for who you are. Help us, Lord. Help us, each and every one. I want to live under the shadow and the umbrella of the gospel, Father. I want to experience the power of your spirit in my life to live and to love. I want to learn how to be a man, not just from other men, but from you, Dad from you. Father, I want to learn how to be a husband, not just by messing up a bunch of times trying to figure it out on my own, but I want to figure out what it is to be a husband and to be faithful. I want to keep my eyes on you. And Jesus, when it comes down to living in this world, help me to live sacrificially as you sacrificed. Help me to stay the course, Lord. Even though they marched you through the streets, help us to stay the course. And even when life gets tough and things get hard, give me the strength. Give me the strength to see it through, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Help us to see the value of the gospel in our everyday life. And you want so much more than to just get us to heaven. You're looking to polish us up so that we can be lights in this world, salt in this earth, and help somebody else. And the world doesn't need sermons, Father. It needs people who've been changed, who are legitimate who are real, whose lives have been so changed that no one can deny I see the effect of God in your life. How did you get that? I pray that for this church, Lord. I pray that for everyone under the sound of my voice from family and friends in Ohio and all over the country and California and Alabama and people everywhere, Father, that we all know. Help somebody to see and know the truth. And I pray that you use us mightily today. Father, maybe there's someone listening this morning. Maybe there's someone, Lord, Who could say, I want that? I've been going to church for too long and 
maybe even pulled away from church for that very reason. I just didn't see any authenticity. Maybe there's somebody today who says, I just don't know you, Lord. Not like that. If that's you this morning, put your faith in Jesus Christ today. Not men, not people, not women. Put your faith in Jesus Christ today. Trust him as the one who paid the price for all your sins and believe that his death was acceptable to God the Father and you putting your faith in him will make you acceptable as well and wash all of your sins away. I pray that for someone this morning. Put your faith in Christ and him alone. And if you're listening this morning and you haven't been going to church and you feel like I just felt like I couldn't because I just wasn't getting anything and it just was no substance there. Father, I pray that person could understand the gospel better today and what you've provided all of us in Christ. And as they start to sacrifice themselves to you, that you would transform them change them, empower them to be victorious in their Christian living every day. I pray that for them today. And I trust your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.